Hi there, my name is Andrew. I'm a senior product manager at Atlassian, and today I'd love to talk about what it really looks like to scale your product org from 1 to 100 people. Now, this is actually something I'm really passionate about. I've been really fortunate to be involved in 8 plus startups and worked in corporates in my career, but I started to see some really similar trends across all these different product orgs. Um, so much so that now at Atlassian, I've got the opportunity to work on developer tooling in the DevOps space to really kind of turbocharge teams going through this small to medium business to, to enterprise scale journey and really start to identify some buckets across how these teams work and, and where they start to change in the way that their underlying behaviors and tool, tool sets look. So let's break down this kind of journey from 1 to 100 and think about a 1, 5, 10, 30 and 100 headcount kind of bucket. We you know lean into the tool chains and practices that empower these teams and not so much talk about the talent acquisition strategies. However, a super interesting subject nonetheless. So let's take ourselves back to thinking about starting a startup. Potentially some people in the audience may have begun their own startups in the past. And if I could think about myself going through that startup journey, I would have really wished to have told myself that security is a non-negotiable development workflow requirement from day one. Right? Modern software development is really fast because it's assembled, not built from scratch. We leverage open source libraries consistently. And that's great practice. But we need to remain vigilant around what those open source packages may have inside of them. And at times, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. So we need to manage this inherent risk by staying on track of it over time. Gartner reports that of, 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 um, of applications online right now, 70% leverage open source packages. And of those 70%, about 75% have vulnerabilities with them. And of that 75%, 51% of vulnerabilities take more than a week to remediate. So you can see that it's a constant threat and something that really needs to be managed as part of underlying sprints and backlog grooming to triage and manage this work for teams to execute against. A really cheap way or low-hanging fruit solution to dealing with vulnerabilities from a really early phase of your product where you're making decisions that you'll be building on top of over time and you want to make sure you reduce your risk profile from really early on is to leverage software composition analysis tools, SCA or SaaS-like security tools to provide that visibility into your risk posture even prior to the first de deployment you ever do on your new product. So let's say that things are going well, the app that you're building is starting to gain some traction and some friends, potentially even maybe one or two hires have come on board to help you. Everyone has opinions on what best to breed and what kind of best practice looks like around development workflows. And you start to see that everyone's picking a different kind of tool to do their job. And I'm kind of here to tell you that tool chain sprawl, the sense of going from one or two tools to start using lots of tools as part of software development is fundamentally a fact of life. And it might sound quite counterintuitive, but as long as you're using the trade-off of managing your underlying budget and runway, don't tool reduce just yet if it can help you move fast. If team members are leveraging software that they feel comfortable in and they're getting outcomes, lean into that for the time being. Right? And if there's opportunities, connect development tools to your work management suite to enable non-technical team members to be part of shipping value as well. Non-technical team members, in this case being like business analysts or product managers, maybe even QA engineers if you're a really conscious business that have brought them on early. So I that last thing, we think about this concept of kind of tool chain sprawl as open DevOps, the sense that you can leverage our tools like Jira and substitute in and out other Atlassian suite products if you want to use a different kind of SCM provider or CICD tool. We make it really easy for that to still plug into Jira and provide value to your workflow. So you can see where work is at at any point in time. An example on screen here is our issue view with connected feature flags, pull requests from an SCM solution, and even build information from a CICD solution as well. By connecting up those tools to Jira, you get insights on where work is at so that all members of the team transparently can see where, where work is within the software development lifecycle. Next up, another example of that is even our deployments view. This here charts out every deployment that's occurred across an, uh, both staging and production environments, so much so that 
business analysts or quality assurance engineers can jump in and understand when a feature is ready to test within staging and then also understand when it's been promoted to production. So let's say things are going even better now. You've got 10 people on the team. Now we're getting really serious. And this might sound like a really kind of cliche one, but the transparent document culture is incredibly critical at this point in time. You've got lots of people doing lots of different work every day, but it's really important that a strong documentation culture that promotes transparency is at the heart of what you do. It's a choice to be transparent. Take it from me seeing lots of different startups. Startups can be incredibly opaque around their documentation. People can hold documents, have them locked down because, over time, but fundamentally, even large organizations like Atlassian have embraced a transparent document culture. You very rarely see a document locked down inside of, inside of Atlassian. And that fosters a really collaborative, low friction environment for people to come in and understand what their thought process is as they're drafting a document and provide feedback and commentary on it so they can do the best work together. A great externality of this process as well is that by being more vigilant around documenting products that are in flight and in progress is that we've seen that out of the State of DevOps report, 3.8 times more likely to implement security practices across these teams, or even more likely to exceed or meet their reliability targets, because there's always that conscious effort put towards how is the product performing in market. Now, something quite interesting is that a lot of teams kind of maybe around that 10 headcount size are starting to maybe make their first marketing hire, or potentially like a content designer or a support engineer. So the act of releasing software is now a much more cross-functional act than ever before. And this is where a new concept of kind of progressive delivery is something that could really democratize the way that your teams release software. You might be aware of leveraging continuous delivery uh, tools that you, know, you might be shipping daily or weekly rather than quarterly or monthly as, as kind of more traditional teams in the waterfall structure you used to. But Progressive delivery wants to bring in those other actors that we just spoke about into the act of releasing software. And they do that through guardrail technology. Think about things like feature flags or observability dashboards. By bringing together team members in a ritual to review how a product is being rolled out to market, marketers, product managers, and developers can together make a decision to roll up or roll down feature flags by 10 or 20% in response to how that product is behaving in market. This is also really important because marketers might leverage rollout percentages as a way to know when they should um, incrementally share the next part of marketing content or even release notes with their customer base. Inside of the last thing, we've actually started to invest a little bit in how we can bring, to, bring life these guardrail technologies within the releases hub. Here you can now see that each issue illustrates its full software development life cycle. You can read where in progress is the Jira issue, what deployment environment is the issue currently in, and how many feature flags are attached to it and what their status is as well. So you're always up to date with where that work is and how close to customers it is. Now next up, let's say our organization's been growing quite a bit. We've got multiple engineering teams at this point in time. Well, a really important thing to note is that as these companies grow, a you build it, you run it structure is incredibly valuable in order to keep scaling and moving fast over time. This graphic attempts to illustrate a number of microservices that might exist within a company. And team A have chosen the best tools that they need to build service one and two. But if there's an issue, it's actually quite challenging for team A to move over to potentially maybe team C and help on service five. Because not only do they need an understanding of the underlying architecture of service five, they also need to come to understand what the tool chain is that that team's leveraging. So the insight here as teams are growing is that it's not just about documenting and having a good understanding and subject matter expertise around the services the teams deploy. It's just as important to have that level of documentation and that redundancy around tooling as well that teams leverage to build software. Let's jump into another insight now. At the 30 headcount level, we want to turn back to security. We spoke about it as our first trend, and it's really important to litmus test how our security practices are growing over time. 
And for that, successful DevSecOps culture teams can be measured by the number of non-technical team members involved in security-related rituals. What does that mean? Well, it means that non-technical team members need to be more exposed to what security practices and vulnerabilities their underlying products and services are encountering. I think of a world where product managers understand the vulnerabilities that exist within their product and they're actually starting to prioritize resolving uh, vulnerabilities ahead of net new feature development or, or tech debt work for that, for that sprint. It's a really nuanced way that illustrates that there's a lot of alignment and clarity around security and its points within an organization. Sometimes you might also see this referred to as shifting left security practices. Instead of simply relying upon security penetration testing reports six to 12 months after features have been released, the goal here is to actually leverage SCA, SAS tools, or potentially even DAS tools as well, as a way to bring in security vulnerabilities and risks into, back into the plan and track phases of work, such that non-technical members of the team with their developers can get involved in triaging those vulnerabilities to re remain the security posture of their product. Now let's do one final one about going up to a 100 headcount team. So operating tool chains, which of, of which are the best kind of services possible and choosing the best tools that they need, at scale can get really expensive. And now is the time at which teams start to consider optimizing their spend. But it's not just a financial driver here, and this isn't a driver towards consolidation. It's actually a driver about illustrating the return on investment we're getting from the tools that we use. And are they fully optimized within a team? Execs want more than just Dora metrics in regards to how their product and engineering teams operate. It's about outcomes of those product teams and their underlying tool chain as well to substantiate that return on investment. An emerging trend you'll see in market right now is this idea of a DevOps management suite or DevOps management tools. Here they're trying to convert engineering events or technical concepts like the count of deployments, the deployment frequency, also things like the level, the amount of security vulnerabilities or risk on certain repositories, even deeper into other concepts like feature flags and how often they're being rolled up versus rolled down and converting all of these very technical developer-centric terms into business insights that non-technical business actors like executives can use to bubble up to speak about their performance and their expertise as an underlying engineering org and feel confident in the reliability and practices of their team. Here they want to turn those insights into things that they can share with their customers about how how reliable against SLAs and SLOs their, their products and teams are. In addition to that, can they turn those into insights that build trust with their investors? So, to close us all off, we've kind of looked at this idea that the tool chain is something that really needs to leverage the best tools possible at any point in time. And that you've got to have a really strong work management tool set that can connect up these tools and convert very technical concepts into insights that both developers and non-technical members of the team can engage with. Really, this is all about empowering software teams to build high quality software faster through collaborative experiences. Either that being via rituals that are implemented within teams, through to tool choices, and finally, how can those tools all connect together to create a transparent and really accountable view of a software team as it scales from one to 100 people. So thank you so much for your time. My name has been Andrew. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or in the Discord after the presentation. Thank you so much.